Good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to have you here today. Um, this is the first time for me for uh, our chair meeting. I'm uh, a long standing member of uh, the Health Creation Alliance. Um, I'm a photojournalist, but I'm also uh, here from a lived experience background. Um, so that's what I bring to the table on a general basis. But today I'll be chairing the meeting and look forward to today's agenda. It looks fascinating. We have um, quite an interesting run through. So um, to begin with, we have um, timings today. We'll be going through, we're having a chance for a quick question and answer after each um, after each instalment, after each sec section, um, but we do have to keep to time. So uh, if you would like to be able to, if you can put your hand up, um, if I can get to you, we will. If not, um, put your answers and questions into the chat box and we'll try and get back to you there. So um, with no further ado, um, I'll hand over to Brian for our review of the year. Thank you very much, Ella. That was uh, it's wonderful to see everybody here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, th thanks for joining us for an exciting and stimulating morning together. Um, I'm Brian Fisher. I'm proud to be chair of the Health Creation Alliance. And we meet today with health inequalities starkly obvious <clears throat> on a background of rising health inequalities dropping life expectancy for the poorest, particularly women. COVID has highlighted endemic injustices, high death rates for our ethnic minorities, for disabled people, for the elderly in social care, residential accommodation. Uh, the cost of living crisis is accelerating these problems, hitting the poor the hardest. It means that the work that we all do becomes increasingly important. And actually, there are signs of progress on the issues that the Alliance fights for. We are beginning to move from the periphery to the center. Having spent much of our almost seven year history shouting from the sidelines about why health creation needs to become a core function of the NHS, working as equal partners with communities, local authorities and other local partners, we now often find ourselves at the center of the action in many ways. Our makeup and membership is one of the reasons. As the leading national cross-sector movement of professionals, community representatives, and people with lived experience working together to address health inequalities, we mirror what our systems, places, and neighborhoods need to become. Sectors multiply working together to create health through community-led development and community strengthening. We find ourselves at the center of national programs. This includes contributing to the design of the core 20 plus five community connector program to make sure it lands well with communities. We've been advising the fuller stock take team on the future of primary care. And we've influenced the systems wide guidance for ICSs working with people and communities. We're forging a wide range of partnerships to drive real long-term solutions to help address health inequalities. We give legitimacy, profile and status to what is already happening while furthering our own knowledge and understanding of how to translate the core features of health creation into approaches that help address health inequalities. We're also increasing, increasingly being asked to support existing spontaneous health creation networks and people and groups that are delivering excellent and pioneering practices. These include local projects across the country, a new health creation group centered in London, and a London Met University course on health creation for social care and health staff. In the wider world, the Health and Care Act has been passed and ICSs are now legal entities. Um, if ICSs can widen their focus beyond the immediate demands of meeting budget requirements, managing demand and dealing with the staffing crisis, they will turn their attention to tackling health inequalities. ICS structures should make it easier to operate in the way that the Alliance recommends, cross-sector, power sharing and responding to communities' agendas. 
this is a real opportunity for the Alliance. There's now a clear read across from health inequalities as seen by the NHS and local authorities to the leveling up agenda. The analysis of inequalities in the leveling up white paper is very similar to ours. We are in touch with the leveling up team and we intend to flesh out their ideas with Alliance thinking. So this is the power of movement and we would love to have the capacity to do much more of this kind of work. Over the last 12 months, we've had a number of special projects and publications, including a report launched earlier this year called Addressing National Health Inequality of Priorities by Taking a Health Creating Approach, Trips Off the Tongue, following um, an NHSE sponsored webinar uh, where we showed how the great health creating work happening across the country supports NHS England's health inequality priorities a series of action events to explore how health creation can be applied to an earlier diagnosis of cancer, better management of cardiovascular disease, and how NHS anchor institutions can better support communities to create health. We've also done research for NHS property services to support them to expand and enhance their NHS open space service to enable more communities the opportunities to access their spaces in ways that work for them, which could make a huge difference to the way uh, co local community groups can actually operate within the NHS. Their active learning programs um, for a range of stakeholders. We've done um, training for uh, trailblazer GPs, trainees and recently qualified GPs, a workshop for West York's health inequality leads, introducing them to health creation, and the development of a nine month health creation learning program for two ICSs in the Southeast. We've been building relationships, trust and collaboration uh, with a range of groups, including the NHS Health Inequalities Team, the King's Fund and the NHS Confederation. And we're pleased that the King's Fund will be um, talking to us later on this morning. Money. Our finances have become significantly more stable over the last year, um, mainly due to us securing larger projects. However, directors and active members continue to offer many hours of pro bono effort. And we really have to secure core funding as a key focus of our three year business plan. Whether we achieve this alone or in collaboration with another organization is a key consideration that we are looking at right now. So what next over the next year? We have an ambitious three year business plan um, to, to advance the organization's stability, in staffing operations and leadership uh, with an enhanced infrastructure and the capacity to build more upon the great work we've already done. And Meron will talk more about this later this morning. We'll take the opportunity that the national changes offer us to coordinate much better and broader approaches to health and social care. And we're already a diverse organization. Uh, and as we grow in the coming year, we want to increase our diversity in terms of race, gender balance, and the mix of professionals from all sectors, people with lived experience and community leaders. And we're debating within the Alliance how we can better reflect in our work and thinking the social determinants of health and the protected characteristics, which as I highlighted at the beginning, are key to understanding and tackling health inequalities. After almost seven years of championing health creation, we are experiencing what might be described as health creation coming of age. And this is the theme for a week long series of events that we're hosting in the autumn culminating in a House of Lords reception. And Meron will talk more about that in a little while. So in the coming years, we have great ambitions for the Health Creation Alliance, ambitions that are reflective of all of our members. In order to achieve those, we need to be invested in. Funders need to see how they can support this vital work and ensuring that they understand and appreciate this and work together with us 
will be a key focus for us in the coming year. We have a new director and we welcome Donna McLaughlin. She brings great experience from the secondary care sector and inspiring interventions in developing a diverse workforce. The environment in which the Alliance operates has radically changed, yet with change comes opportunity. And as the Alliance moves to the next level, so there is an opportunity for someone new to help steer its course. As a result, I will step down as chair. I have been proud to steer the Alliance into such a great position. I won't stop being chair until we find a new one, and I will continue to support the Alliance in the future. You haven't seen the last of me. So finally, thanks to key members and partners. We have so many people and organizations to thank for their understanding, support, and cooperation. These include various PCN partners, NHS England, the Health Foundation, Danny Kruger, who will be speaking to us later, the C2 Network, Health Watch, C4PC, Greater Manchester, NHS Confederation, King's Fund, and Southwest CSU, all have contributed enormously to the work of the Alliance over the last year. Our patron, Lord Adibawali, has been a rock and a great support throughout the year. I want to thank Meron, our chief exec, who works tirelessly for the Alliance, and Neil, who's helped us get our message across and always finds ways to improve our approach. Working with our varied and insightful directors has been a constant pleasure and a learning opportunity. So thanks again for coming on this exciting journey with us. We relish the task and you're delighted that we're working on it together. So I look forward to the rest of the morning. Um, Ella, if you take us through the agenda, yeah. if we move on to the next thing, that would be great. Welcome, uh, welcome all, and thanks very much. Back to you, Ella. Thank you, Brian, and you should be very proud of the progress that's been made um, during the course of your time at the Health Creation Alliance. So um, we now um, go over to Meron, but before that, I shall just take you through um, today's um, schedule. So. Um, to start with, we'll be looking at what's upcoming in the um, in the business plan that Meron and the team have been working on. Um, that's from 10.20 to 10.40, but we'll be having a short five minutes question and answers um, after that. 10.40, we're having a breakout where we'll be working with other members um, to look at various things, which I'll go over um, beforehand. Um, we'll be having some feedback as well after that at 10.55. 11 o'clock, we will be looking at changes in the lands in the health landscape with... Um, so, I'm sorry, Ella, yeah. you make so You don't need to get through the whole thing, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's actually 10.40 to 11, that's Chris Neal is going to be joining us. Uh, and then we'll have time, to break yeah. out following that. Okie dokie, yeah. I've got that. Tell you what, we'll go straight over to Meryn in the meantime. <laughs> so I've got the right information put to me. She's going to go over what um what ambitious plans have been um been cooked up with the team. So over to you, Meryn, and afterwards we'll have a, a short question and answers. So over to you, Meryn. Thank you, Ella, very much. And thank you, Brian, as well. And there'll be plenty of time for thank yous for your huge efforts over the last four years going forward. But um you know, pleased that you're you're uh, going to be continuing as as chair until we have uh, sourced a, a, a chair to take us into the next five years or so, um, and we'll be shortly announcing the process for sourcing that individual. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is just take you through our ambitions and business plan in a little bit more detail than Brian has. Um, and uh, and hopefully that will set the scene for conversations in the breakout sessions. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing to, uh, from Chris as well uh, in, in a little while. That will also flavour our conversations. So, um, Neil, do you want to put the first slide on? Because our attention, uh, for those of you who are new to the, the Health Creation Alliance, um, the Health Creation Alliance is the leading national cross-sector group addressing health inequalities through health creation, and we are a movement. Um, and our mission is to increase the number of years people live in good health in every community. 
Um, and our ambition is to put health creation at the centre of place-based reforms at all levels, so that it becomes business as usual, with equal focus of the treatment and prevention of ill health. So our attention has been on the reality of what it is that creates health in communities for people with lived experience and at the front line of services. And we have a health creation framework. I'm not going to present that today because we do that frequently and it's on our website. But health creation is all about increasing the collective agency, um, supporting communities to gain control because having control over our lives and environments helps us to become and to stay well. So health creation isn't new. It's not something we've invented. It's been happening in pockets for centuries, uh, actually, and certainly many decades uh, as, a, as a thing. But um, through its members and partners, what the Health Creation Alliance has done is we've drawn attention to uh, some of the excellent health creating practice that's already happening. We've been finding it and making it, drawing attention to it, providing a status, you know, a platform, uh, raising the status and profile of this work so that it starts to become recognised as important and invested in. So health creation is critical for underserved communities of all kinds. The statistics, as Brian said, show that the pandemic has had a disproportionate effect on, on many of them. So increased mortality rate for black African males, for example, 4.2 times the average in the first wave of COVID. Female wheelchair users were 11 times more likely to die. And young people aged 18 to 25 with a learning disability, 30 times more likely to die. So the pandemic has, uh, has, has done this, but the pandemic has also shown glimpses of what might be possible and caused many people throughout our health and care systems to look for new solutions. Um, but already upon us, we have new crises emerging. The energy crisis, cost of living crisis, food security issues and more could go on. Um, things are going to get much more difficult and uh, uh, for many kinds of communities, communities experiencing poverty, discrimination, injustices of all types uh, and many more. So adopting health creation as a means of addressing health inequalities is going to be even more important as more of our communities go forward. So the next slide shows really that through all of this, the Health Creation Alliance has been working to bring about systems change from the bottom up. So we've got our, our framework, the three C's, um, contact, confidence and control, building contact between people helps to increase their confidence and raises control. Um, and uh, we've, um, we've got six features of health creating practice that what people tell us make the biggest difference to their health. And that helps to define the community, the, the front line, if you like, what, how those relationships should work. But we've also been doing work at the neighborhood level and they're looking to do more at the place level and basically right up to see how, you know, how that, those systems can change from the bottom up. And as we do this, the scope of health, and health creation is broadening to uh, much more to address health, uh, structural inequalities. They've always been part of health creation, but we focused on the agency of people because that's at the heart of this. But structural inequalities um, become possible to address um, uh, and the wider determinants of health through new pathways emerging as, um, as, the, uh, as, as sectors um, work together. So as we go up to these levels, we can see more multidisciplinary working happening. So this, we can, we can enable more people to get access to things like adequate housing, debt advice, those elements that are the wider determinants of health. But there are limits to what professionals can do. So we need to build also a commitment to a health creation ecosystem and infrastructure to address some of these uh, more intractable injustices. So people are waking up to the Health Creation Alliance, to who we are and to the value of what we have to offer. And uh, we're considered an important player now, I think in NHS transformation. Uh, demand for our insights is certainly learning and unlearning is certainly growing. And we have a proven model of change. We are solutions focused and we base our learning on excellent and, peer and pioneering practice that's already happening on the ground. So members offer great access to real world solutions uh, and, and that experience and our approach to working with members 
to uh, showcase this and to enable the learning to be to be shared. And uh, it has been further refined over the last 12 to 18 months, and we're now offering that widely. We're also looking at promoting things that are enabling health creation and calling out the things that are inhibiting health creation. But this is a huge task. So we're not doing this in as full a way as we would like to do. But health creation is that common currency that can enable that bottom up um, systems change to, to happen. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this slide is really just to show you what Brian has been talking about, some of the reports that he's been talking about, and the fact we're working with the Core 20 plus 5 team. And we're also working, uh, we're going to be producing another couple of documents soon, the NHS Property Services one that, that Brian talked about, and the, um, uh, the um, uh, Health Foundation for two further reports. And out of these reports, we came up with, if you go to the next slide, the, the um, uh, these 10 key messages, which uh, are for ICSs and all their constituent parts, uh, local authorities, etc. cetera. Um, so um, and we called these building back together, our, our building back together 10 key messages, because we're gonna need to build back together with communities and with other local partners if we're gonna be successful. Uh, and if we're going to build back better and fairer. Um, so uh, these 10 things are very similar to NHS England's 10 principles. We published these in April. The 10 principles were published in September and we have been working with the people and communities team, uh, public, sorry, public participation team, at NHS England uh, on systems wide guidance. And we've been helping to um, influence that. Um, they are similar, but different. I would say these 10 key messages. Um, so if we go to the next slide, just to talk a little bit about, <clears throat> sorry, about our business plan in particular, we have done a SWOT analysis and we've also done a gap analysis and that is a, a, an analysis of the gap in capacity and skills um, to go forward. And these have led to nine critical success factors that we um, are adopting. And in, this, in essence, this is about um, consolidating and improving our financial viability and stability, uh, looking at staffings, um, operations, leadership, and influence and reach credibility and legitimacy <coughs> so that we have the infrastructure and capacity to take our work with members and partners onto a new level. And it's really important that I bring out that our credibility and legitimacy come from our deep connection to communities. And that happens through our members um, that are very diverse. And this is increasingly noted as, an, as a point of difference to either top-down organizations or mainstream organizations that, that are doing similar types of work now. Uh, so as we grow, we're looking for ways of enhancing our connections with all of you to keep our work grounded. And thank you for your support in all of this. It, um, been really great working with you this last year or so. So I'm not going to go through all these nine critical success factors, um, but we, uh, it, you know, they're, they're there. Um, we'll be able to uh, make them available to you to have a look at. Do you want to go to the next slide? This is to show um, that we're redefining our relationship between our non-exec directors. Uh, who will have more of an advisory role and our executive team who will be responsible for delivery going forward. As well as Brian, our chair, we have uh, five non-exec directors at present. That's Lynn Bowers, Telly Amaludden, Alex McCraw, Peter Hay, who's also our treasurer, and Donna McLaughlin, who recently joined us and she's filling a gap in secondary care and also brings on the ground experience of health creating approaches to recruiting from local communities to uh, an NHS trust. And we're looking for non-exec directors to fill our gaps in skills and experience, fill particular gaps, to increase the diversity of our organization further and to increase the proportion um, uh, who are currently involved in systems change, so doing it out there, um, and increase the number of community leaders and people with lived experience because um, we do have uh, one chair currently who would fit that category if you like but we want uh, sorry one director um, but we, we we are looking to diversify that further. Um, Neil McGregor-Patterson and myself are 
the directors that are operating on the more on the executive side and we're also looking to expand the executive team so the purple are our functions that are currently filled or we have people that we can draw on to to make these things happen and the orange are our posts that we're seeking to fill over the next perhaps two years when we can build uh, to, to do that um, and so these are all um, you know, appointments we're looking to, to make at some point over the next couple of years. So if we go to our next slide, um, when it comes to funding, um, that we've had most success in funding um, on in terms of our uh, th those that are in blue here. So um, bespoke discovery learning programs, um, and we, we, we've had some success in, in terms of that, but particularly special projects and publications. We've also in the past drawn uh, resources from events as well, and we can do that going forward. Um, so the pink are where we do these uh, these elements to some degree, um, but we receive no core funding and have we have we're an organisation that doesn't have legacy funding. Uh, so um, uh, for so our I have a voice program is um, you know is ready to go. Uh, we need the core funding for that. Movements and networks. Our, our, our national movement is is funded through um, uh, through our pro bono effort, if you like, or through through the community benefit work that we the, 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 you know, the we gen from the work we generate through our paid work, and also um, our dialogue with influencers and decision makers. All this is um, is is funded through the work that we do in blue. So we we offer a huge community benefit for the amount of of trading that we do. Um, we're currently working with a fundraiser to secure funding and increase our capacity to offer all of this and much more on a much bigger scale. So we do some of this already. We want to do much more of it because we think that these are the ways to make the change happen from the bottom up. And we're on target to meet our business plan projection, which is for 250,000 turnover in 2022 to 23 and up to 500,000 by 2023-24. And so, and we are, our intention is to essentially become a, a kind of professional body or alliance for health creation. So if we go to the next slide, uh, partnership working is in our DNA. We're an alliance. There are many benefits to partnership working. We're always looking to find the win-wins in these situations. We're currently exploring uh, a number of deeper partnerships uh, with a handful of organizations. And we want to do this to, to grow more quickly, to have a bigger impact together, to achieve our ambitions and their ambitions, to spread excellence in health creation, to help larger organizations to share power and work constructively with a small organization. And we're having conversations presently with organizations like the King's Fund and NHS Confederation to, uh, to you know, about how that could possibly work. Um, and I, I've got this picture in my head of um, Penny Farthing where, you know, the little wheel is just as important as the big wheel, but it's little and, you know, it, it mustn't be crushed in by the big wheel or, uh, or somehow, you know, they, they need to operate together to make the whole thing work. Um, and to give large organizations and systems partners uh, the, the, a feel for the power of a national movement like the Health Creation Alliance, because there's huge power in, in our networks and in our, our movement approach. So mutual, mutuality and reciprocity are very important for us in this. And I just want to thank Chris Naylor, who's coming, who's speaking in a little while from the King's Fund. We've been talking about this, uh, the way this partnership might work between our organisations. If we go to the next slide, um, this is a little bit more about our coming of age uh, series of events that we're aiming to host in uh, October, November time, um, mostly online, but we will be having um, uh, one or more uh, physical events with House of Lords reception as well. And um, this will really be an important moment for us because health creation has a critical role to play within many of the programmes that are currently being rolled out. Uh, and um, you know we want to make sure that 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 we um, that the health creation is 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 within all of those. So population health management, for example, how can 
um, how can uh, the system and, and professionals share share the data that is being that is so important in population and health management with communities in ways that enable the community to help them make sense of it and then they can generate solutions together uh, for example so there's all sorts of um, things that we'll be looking to, to focus on what does a health creating approach to xyz look like um, and we'll, we'll be looking to host awards and also, um, you know, there's a, a number of purposes for this. Uh, so, um, and, and it, it's all the whole, all of the purposes um, support our ambition. So, we are looking for people to help us to bring these sessions together intelligently, and we are looking for sponsors for these sessions as well, because this is going to cost some money. So, if you know people who might be interested in sponsoring uh, supporting one of these sessions we'd love to hear from you so going to the next slide our outputs and outcomes um, we think there's well we've identified four outputs and outcomes i won't read all of these out um, but i wanted to draw attention to the final one actually the health creation lines being more of an equal mix of professionals and people with lived experience at all levels. So we meld our skills, we learn from each other, we blur the boundaries. And um, that's you know, something that we're quite keen on doing. Um, and Ella chairing today is an example of that. We've worked with Ella in a number of capacities and other um, people with lived experience and community leaders. So this is, um, this is about uh, you know, what we want to achieve through all of this. And um, I think the final slide, from me is about to come up. So there will be opportunities over the coming 12 months, actually beyond, you know, uh, 24, 36 months, um, uh, you know, both positions. Uh, we're growing our associate base to uh, be able to uh, um, uh, um, deliver some of the programs that we're being asked to uh, be, be involved in. Um, and we are obviously um, going to announce our, our process soon for chairs, non-exec directors, etc. Looking for other core team members, um, sponsorship, fund, core funders, etc. So if you can help us with any of that, we'd be, love to hear from you. And, and of course, evolving our connection with, with our members as well. Um, we, we have significant connection in all sorts of ways. Um, and we, we, we want to you know, make sure that as we have the capacity and infrastructure in place to be able to grow, you know, to be able to grow that as well, that, we, that we're able to, we know what, what we need to do. Um, so I hope that gives you a good background. Um, thank you for uh, your generosity uh, of your time, your support, your help, your encouragement over the last six and a half years. Um, what we've done and done together uh, it has been phenomenal actually uh, on so little and we're still here being as relevant as ever and speaking to the current reality so thank you and I do hope that gives you a taster for the breakout session which we'll be having after Chris uh, speaks next so happy to take any questions. Okay then thank you Maren some fascinating and in-depth work there that's been done and um Fingers crossed for a positive year ahead. So um, if there are any questions, please feel like you can put your hands up. We'll see what we can get through. Um, and if not, then pop it into the chat box and we'll have a look there. And at 11. Over four, to Dean, Dean O'Shea. Yeah. Question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say in response to um, Merrin's presentation. Thank you for that, Mary. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm someone who's quite new to um, to the Health Creation Alliance. Uh, I've been discovered it through uh, another group. Um, so so I'm still learning about the, you know, the, the about the Health Creation Alliance, but, but it, it certainly seems a jolly good uh, organisation and a, with a good ethos and, and uh, looking at how to make groups, community groups, communities become healthier, and that can only be a good thing. So I applaud the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you, Dean. Got Kiris there with his hand up. Hi, sorry for joining you late. Um, uh, yeah, so I think um, a couple of things. I, I'd be kind of uh, keen on looking at how we can support the Creative Alliance in terms of looking at its membership and how we can get it a bit more diverse uh, and that kind of reaching out to various networks would be one way of doing that. And secondly, obviously there's a lot of priority at the moment around health inequalities. So obviously I've been spoken to Meron and, and Neil as well in terms of uh, the direction of what that looks like for the creation in terms of going forward. So just two things I wanted to kind of raise really. Thank you, Kirit. I think, um, do we need to move on now? So is there anybody else there? No. Okay, thank you. So now um, we'll be moving on to speak to Chris Naylor from the King's Fund, which is um, fantastic. So we are going to be learning about changes in the health landscape and what it means for health inequalities. Where do the opportunities for systems-wide health creation lie? And after that, we'll be having a quick question and answer again. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Hi, hello and morning, everyone. Um, pleasure to join you uh, this morning. It's really great to hear those updates um, from Meryn and Brian about the, the work that the Health Creation Alliance is doing, because it, it really is kind of a great cutting edge work and um, very pleased to kind of be part of your discussions this morning. Um, so Meryn asked me to give a, a, a short presentation, which is really just a kind of overview of some of the changes currently taking place in the health and care system. And then I think the idea is we can then have a bit of a discussion about um, what those changes might mean for the work that we're, we're trying to do in this space um, for, for, for taking health creating approaches. Uh, um, and you might have spotted that um, uh, Sajid Javid earlier in the year talked about wanting, wanting 2022 to be a year of reform for the NHS. That was the phrase he used, a year of reform. And I, I think for many people working in the health system, particularly people who've been working in the NHS for some time, uh, may well retort to that, that they feel like every year of their working lives has been a year of reform. There's, a, there's certainly no shortage of, of change in the NHS. There's almost continual change. And it always comes with a whole kind of battery of new terminology and acronyms and so on. Um, and I think all of that can understandably provoke a bit of scepticism um, and, and sometimes even hostility um, towards, uh, towards reform and towards change. Um, and so what I'm going to um, encourage everyone to do during this presentation, the kind of a uh, sort of perspective that I'm, I'm going to be coming from is that when, when, when we look at health and care reforms, there is always quite a lot of froth. There's a lot of sort of, you know, the acronyms, the terminology. Um, but underneath the turbulence and underneath the froth, there are some deeper currents. And, and I think it's more important to understand those deeper changes going on than it is to understand the latest buzzwords, which frankly come and go on a yearly basis. Um, so I'm gonna put up some slides, hopefully. Um, and bear with me. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen, Chris. Yeah, I'm on it. I'm just making sure that it comes up in the right form. Okay, can can people see the slides now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Chris. Fine. And can you just see the slides, or are you getting all of my notes pages as well? No, just the slides. Though. That is reassuring. Good to know. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so so yeah, the, the the point the point I wanted to make was that it's more important to kind of understand the deeper changes than it is to to understand the buzzwords. Uh, and I think the um, the key change that's been going on over the last few years is this idea from shifting from competition to collaboration. So the last time we had uh, a, um, a major piece of health and care legislation go through Parliament until the recent one that's just gone through Parliament a couple of weeks ago was the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. And I would call that piece of legislation really the high watermark in terms of trying to use market based mechanisms and competition to try and drive up the standards of care across the, the health system. Um, but what we've seen since then 
is actually the people running the NHS and the, and the, uh, and the system more broadly around the NHS kind of rowing back from that philosophy uh, and putting much more of an emphasis on collaboration. So from the five year forward view onwards, um, NHS England has really been pushing this agenda that's around integration, about um, organizers, organizations coming together uh, to try and get over some of these uh, boundaries in the sector between you know, health and social care or between hospital and uh, primary care. Uh, mental and physical health care and so on uh, and that's that that's been continued through the NHS long-term plan in 2019 um, and throughout that period of time um, people working in the NHS have really been doing their best to work within a legal framework that's been increasingly out of kilter with how the service is actually being run in practice uh, until a couple of years ago NHS England effectively said to the government, we think we've gone as far as we can with this, we need legislative change to try and bring the laws more in line with what we're actually doing in practice. So that's that that in a nutshell is where the health and care bill uh, that's just passed through Parliament um, comes from. Um, so uh, and the centrepiece of that new legislation is the integrated care system, the ICS. So we've got another um, acronym with us. Um, and uh, the integrated care is something that um, the system has been working on for some years now. So we've had the integrated care pioneers, you might remember a few years ago. Then we had the Vanguard sites, which came with their own raft of acronyms. Then we had STPs, which over time became ICSs. Um, so this is all, this is sort of what I mean by the froth. There's a lot of change, but underneath all of that, the direction has stayed the same. Each of those things has fundamentally been about integration in various forms. It's about place-based care, so shifting from an organisational focus to a place-based one. And it's been about collaboration across teams, across organisations and across sectors. Um, so Meron's already... Uh, used this uh, framework that NHS England uh, use to talk about how the system's organised. So system, place and neighbourhood. Um, in some ways, it's an unhelpful um, framework. The, 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 the language certainly is, is slightly um, unhelpful, but I'm, I'm going to use it and I'm going to talk about um, what this shift of collaboration means at each of those three levels and, and what it what it looks like. So firstly, thinking about integrated care systems, um, ICSs are intended to be about bringing together all of the organisations and sectors you can see on this slide to, to try and take a, a collective view of what are the health needs of our local population? What's the sort of what's our vision for meeting those needs and, and what changes do we bring about collectively to put that vision into practice? Um, so it's deliberately uh, blurring the distinction between commissioners and providers. It's deliberately bringing together NHS with local authority, with voluntary sector. Um, uh, and the, the sort of philosophy of an ICS really to, uh, is that um, if, if, say, in South Yorkshire, there's, there's a, a, an issue with social care services, that isn't a social care problem. It's a collective problem, it's a system problem, and all of the partners in South Yorkshire uh, then need to work together to think about what's our part in meeting that problem. Um, so that's that's the kind of underlying philosophy behind an ICS. Um, they, they have some uh, uh, history to them, as I alluded to, they started life as sustainability and transformation partnerships back in 2015. And then essentially over the years since then, they've evolved into this uh, uh, this concept of the integrated care system. And throughout that period of time, it's really important to stress that these have been informal partnerships. They've not had any hard powers. Um, people have been, the people running them have been doing it on top of their day jobs. Um, everything's rested on building consensus, developing trust, taking people with them. Um, and on one argument, that's been one of the strengths of ICSs to date, because if you bring about change through gradually building up a local consensus, arguably it's more likely to stick. 
But other people have argued that you can only go so far with a voluntary partnership. Sooner or later, you need something with more teeth and where there's a legal obligation to work together. So that, that argument won out. And that's uh, the, the big change that's happening in, um, on the 1st of July, uh, now that the health and care uh, bill has gone through Parliament. Um, ICSs are becoming statutory NHS organisations for the first time. And that raises a little bit of a dilemma because as I said, um, people have been trying to position these things as equal partnerships um, between NHS, local government, third sector. But how can something be an equal partnership at the same time as being a, a statutory NHS organisation? So the, the way the legislators have attempted to square that circle is to put two things at the top of each integrated care system. There's an integrated care partnership, which is a, a committee with very broad membership, and that's where this this spirit of equal partnership is in, intended to live on. And then there's the integrated care board, which is where the NHS money sits. Um, that's what's going to be replacing um, the clinical commissioning groups, which will cease to exist on the 1st of July and have their functions taken over by the ICBs. So we have a whole set of acronyms. We have ICSs, ICPs, ICBs, and a word of caution because the acronym ICP was already being used in many parts of the country um, to refer to things at place level, um, integrated care providers or partnerships at place level. Um, so if you're talking to people about ICPs, just a word of caution, um, check that you're both talking about the, the same ICP because the, 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 those three letters are being used differently in different parts of the country at the moment. Um, so that's the, the, the changes at system level. Um, at place level, so you know this. The, the, these are the kind of more identifiable places within systems. You know, so if a, if one of the ICSs is South Yorkshire, a place within that is Sheffield, for example. Um, and um, the, this is where the reforms get really, really permissive. Um, not there's not a lot in the legislation that says what has to happen at place level. But we at the King's Fund have been arguing for some time that actually most of the work of integration and, and, and changing services needs to happen at this more local footprint. Um, and, and that place-based partnerships really need to be the, the foundation, the building blocks of integrated care systems. So we, we put out a report last year making that argument. NHS England have um, uh, been singling a, a similar tune actually. So they put out a guidance document last year called Thriving Places, which talked a lot about the principle of subsidiarity, uh, the primacy of place, and the need to, for ICSs to delegate some of their powers and responsibilities down to place level. Um, but nonetheless, there's still been a bit of a concern that because the legislation puts all of the statutory powers and responsibilities at this kind of bigger system level, that there'll be a gravitational pull uh, uh, up to that level. Um, so as a bit of a corrective to that risk, the Department of Health put out a white paper in February, which was really trying to um, put a bit more heft around this, this idea of place-based partnership working. And what that white paper says is that by April of 2023, every place in the country has to have a formal governance arrangement for partnership working. Uh, they have to have identified a single leader for health and care in that place. And they have to have identified some shared local priorities that they're, they're going to try and pursue together. Now, in some parts of the country, um, frankly, that's job done already. So there are places uh, uh, um, where they've been working in this way for some time. They already have those governance arrangements. They already know what their local priorities are. So there's not that much to do. Um, for other parts of the country where these partnerships are less well developed, um, actually doing all of that by April of next year is, is going to be quite a challenge. Um, so uh, a, a mixed picture across the country. Um, if we move then on to the more local level, uh, neighbourhood level, um, the, the primary care networks uh, that have been in place for some time are obviously a really key player in, in this space. And NHS England, when PCNs were first set up, gave them three fundamental tasks. One was about improving core general practice. Um, so that's partly about um, using the new additional roles that have become available, including social prescribing link workers, uh, but also physios, pharmacists, uh, paramedics and others. Um, then there's a second objective for PCNs, which is uh, about this idea of 
the, the primary care network being the home of integrated multidisciplinary teams, for example, for, for people with complex needs. Um, and then there's a third objective, which is about uh, the role of primary care networks in improving the health of the local population. So this is where we really potentially get um, in, into the health creation space. Um, and, and so there's some really um, amazing examples that you may be aware of, of, uh, of, of kind of really community centered general practice um, where they are taking this health creation approach already. Um, I, I would say that that's the exception rather than the rule though, and that in most PCNs at the moment, the, the state the, the the state of primary care at the moment and the, and the pressures that general practice is under it are so intense that really they're just focusing on the first one or two of, of the three things in this list uh, and, and that really engaging with the kind of population health and health creation agenda is still on the to-do list um, just as GP practices have been working closer together, so too have the uh, NHS trusts that provide acute hospital care and, and mental health care. Um, there, there have been these things, provider collaboratives in some parts of the country for a few years. Um, uh, what's new now is that NHS England have sort of mandated this way of working. So this is about um, neighboring acute hospital trusts or mental health trusts um, coming together, not merging fully necessarily, but pooling some of their resources, trying to think about how do we improve efficiency by uh, using economies of scale? How do we make our services more sustainable um, by kind of sharing the workforce in smarter ways across our different trusts? And how do we improve the quality of care by um, tackling some of the unwarranted clinical variation that you sometimes see? Um, so, um, some, as I say, some NHS trusts have been working in that way for some years. Um, it, it, it accelerated during the pandemic with uh, more and more trusts starting to think about how do we share workforce, for example. Uh, but now it's become a kind of mandated policy. Uh, there isn't a national blueprint for it, though. So um, uh, NHS trusts have been told that they have to come together into these collaboratives, but they've not really been told what the collaboratives are for. That's a uh, um, Kind of down to them um, but i think they are set to be quite powerful players in the system in future um, i want to say a brief word about some of the changes in other parts of the system so just as the health and care system is changing so too is the public health system um, public health england has been dissolved now uh, and the responsibilities that phe used to have have been split across this new organization that the the um uh uh, UK um, Health Security Agency and also uh, OHID, uh, the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. So the UK HSA is more about kind of um, health protection. Uh, so thinking about um, uh, pandemic response and control of infectious diseases. OHID, which sits within the Department of Health, is uh, the organisation that's thinking about health improvement and um, uh, so the kind of health promotion, health creation type approaches and the tackling of health inequalities. Um, some of the responsibilities of PHG have also gone across to NHS England. Uh, so there is a bit of a risk, I think, um, of there, there being a bit of sort of not, uh, these three players in public health not, not always being aligned with each other in future and, and a question of who's going to be accountable for what. Is, it, is that accountability going to be sufficiently clear? Uh, we've also got the integrated care systems moving into this space as well. So many of the ICSs are recruiting directors of population health at the moment. And I think it um, remains to be seen what role they will play relative to the role of directors of public health that uh, sit in, in the, the public health teams and local authorities. Uh, Merrin also referred to the core 20 plus 5 approach, and that's NH, the, the approach that NHS England is taking to thinking about what's the NHS's role in tackling health inequalities. Um, so um, I think the good news uh, uh, on population health and inequalities is that it, it really does feel that this is getting increased attention, particularly the inequalities agenda is getting increased attention in the wake of the pandemic. I think the question is though, do all of these pieces of the jigsaw add up to a coherent approach to population health? Or, or is it going to be a, a bit of a mess of different initiatives being led by different organisations? 
Um, quick word on social care. Um, there's uh, significant reforms to the social care sector as well. Uh, the, the most eye-catching of those are around how social care is going to be funded in future and the cap that's being introduced uh, to um, stop people facing uh, catastrophic care costs um, uh, um, uh, and um, as well as those changes to the, the funding of social care, the government released a white paper at the end of last year talking about um, changing how social care services are provided. So thinking, for example, about increasing the range of supported housing options that are available, uh, providing funding to trial better ways of supporting carers, um, and investment in the, the professional development of the social care workforce. Uh, last sector I wanted to touch on was mental health uh, before I bring this to a close. Um, I think one of the most exciting things going on in the mental health world at the moment is the implementation of the community mental health framework that NHS England published a few years ago. So this, this is a framework that sets a, a set of principles for what community mental health care should look like. Um, similarly to the, to the sort of ICS reforms, it's quite permissive. So there's quite a lot of local autonomy in terms of how they put the principles into practice. But the idea is that we are uh, trying to integrate mental health and primary care services. We're moving from a system that's based on referral to specialist care and then discharge to a more flexible model where care and support can be easily stepped up and down as people's needs change. Um, trying to provide more holistic support, um, uh, so including thinking about um, the physical health care needs of people with mental health problems, um, employment support, support for other needs like uh, substance use and so on. Uh, and, and a really important thread of the community mental health framework is working more closely with third sector organisations and, and making better use of assets in the local community in order to help people have a higher quality of life and to promote health and well-being and, and prevent mental ill health. So I think um, that that kind of takes the, uh, the community mental health sector into this health creation space as well. So that has been that was trialled in 12 early implementer sites and now it's being rolled out across the rest of England. So to bring all of this to a close, <laughs> there's a lot of change going on. Will any of this lead to a different outcome? Um, uh, I, I, I like this quote from, from Chris Ham, who said that his, his vision for ICSs was that they should look and feel different to any organisation we've had before in the NHS. And I, I think there is an opportunity there uh, that, that, that they could be a fundamental turning point if they do the things that I put on this slide. So if we get that spirit of equal partnership right, if we put the principle of subsidiarity into practice, um, if ICSs get much better um, than their predecessors at using the insights from local people and patients and families, um, then I think there's, there's, a, there's a chance that this could be a real turning point. Um, there is also, though, a risk, and I want to be completely candid about this, that ICS has just become, you know, uh, that, we, that, we, that we continue kind of well-established ways of working within these new organisations, and ICS has become the latest in a long line of three letter acronyms uh, and that they, the way that they function isn't terribly different to CCGs or PCTs or you know, any of the other uh, bodies that have come before them. Um, so the Health and Care Act, it became an act uh, two weeks ago, I think. It is a, it, it, it's helpful in as much that there, over the last few years, people have been trying to uh, work in this more kind of collaborative partnership based way yeah. have come across various legal barriers and the act removes some of those barriers but the the legislation is just an enabler fundamentally it's not the legislation that's going to determine how this plays out it's what people do with it so translating the reforms into real changes for people and communities will depend on what happens locally to build new relationships to develop new ways of working and I, I've spent a lot of time over the last year talking to sort of leaders in the NHS, uh, people setting up integrated care systems and I don't doubt that they do sincerely want it to be different this time, they, they want to build new relationships with local partners, they want to be working with local communities in a different way, they want to shift resources upstream to give uh, greater priority to prevention and health creation but they're 
This is happening at a very, very challenging time in the history of the health and care system where we have these workforce crises and um, you know, uh, the, the huge issue of recovery from the pandemic. So um, the will is there, but there is a risk of people's attention being diverted back to those kind of traditional clinical NHS concerns. Um, uh, 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 and, and, and so I think it, you know, it, it will take all of us, it will take uh, all of us <clears throat> to kind of work with NHS partners to help this change um, get made in practice. Thank you very much. That's, I will end on that note, um, but I hope that's given you some food for thought. Thank you, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. And, you know, it is a challenging time indeed. Um, some brilliant, promising ideas and changes there. Um, and if people do do what was on the slides, it would all be a lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, so is there anybody with any questions for Chris? Um, I'm just looking to see if anyone's got their hands up first, but feel free to put a question in the chat box as well. Let's see. Oh, I think I saw somebody there. Brian, um, you've got Brian and then Lynn and then oh, Mary. Oh, and yes, hello. Kieran. My yeah, list Kieran is also um, um, put a, a question in the chat. Column. So, who's going first? Brian, should we go with you first? Um, I, I can, but Dave, I think Dave Trigger wanted to speak. Did okay. he? Yep. Yeah. Hello, Dave. That's fine. If that's Kick off with Dave. Uh, I, go, for, go for it, Dave. I'm very grateful for Chris's talk. I think uh, it, it puts everything into perspective except for money and the problem apart from workforce is how we're going to pay for all of this and so for example in, in I live in Worcestershire we have a major problem at the moment with dental uh, access for example and a lot of our dentists are now going to only offer private treatment rather than NHS so we can see collapses of individual services because of money. Uh, and I wondered if Chris had got any views on how much extra funding we're going to need to really make ICSs and so on work properly for the benefit of people. Thanks, Dave. I mean, absolutely. You know, the, it, the, that is the re reality of this this moment, the, the, both in terms of money and workforce, very challenging context. Um, we haven't done an analysis to sort of um, estimate, you know, what's the gap that needs to be plugged um, financially, but the, the clear message from the government has been one about, okay, we've had uh, a lot of money go into the NHS during the pandemic, now the NHS needs to live within its means. So we're getting quite a hard line from Sajid Javid around the prospect of, you know, I, I don't think there are going to be big increases in funding um, uh, for, for, the, for the health system over the next few years unless something changes. Okay, I'm um, just worried about time and um, time for one more question and perhaps Chris might be happy to answer some questions on the chat box. I'm not sure, but that might be if anyone's got burning questions. Sure. So who who would like to go next, Brian, or should we go with one of the mem one of our guests today, one of our members? Yeah, start start with guests. Don't start with guests. So Lynn. Family hold back. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. I um, thank you, Ella. Thank That's you, Chris. Right. An excellent presentation of a very complex matter. I just think there's a fundamental issue um, uh, uh, that uh, we don't seem to be talking about it, but in relation to means tested versus free at the point of care, pathogenic versus salutogenic models, social model of health versus medical model of health. And um, in terms of the definitions of ICS place and neighbourhood, um, these would seem to be not relevant to rural and coastal areas, which is 20% of our population and includes many of the most deprived members of our population. So it doesn't seem to be capturing the diversity and deprivation across the UK. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Lynn. I think um, sort of the, the, the sort of system place neighbourhood um, level works quite well in areas where uh, like, you know, sort of like Greater Manchester, where you've got a set of kind of unitary um, authorities um, and it's quite clear what the place is. Um, but in, in, in more rural parts of the country, particularly where you've got two tier local governments with county and district councils, some of the, the, these places um, don't really feel like natural communities. Uh, and that's that those are the ones where um, they've got much more of an uphill um, struggle over the next 12 months to build these place based partnerships. 
Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to our breakout session now, but that was excellent. And just to repeat what Neil's saying, um, if you would like to put your emails in the chat box, um, we can send you a copy of the video and, and put you in touch. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so 11.05 um, to 11.30, we're going to have a breakout. I've put some of the questions in the chat there, but um, we're going to ask you to collaborate now. Um, here are the questions for you. So working with members and partners um, to embed to um, cre creation to systems from the bottom up. What insight can you offer to help us fulfill the health creation's ambitions? Um, how can you personally play a part? And how might your organisation work with the Health Creation Alliance to achieve mutual goals? And what sort of connection with the Health Creation, creation Alliance um, support you to do this so hopefully we'll have some um some opportunity to talk now and, and come up with some ideas so over to you guys uh, to uh, neil to put you into some roots so good luck okay. guys see you on the other side when we'll thank be talking you. to danny kruger next yeah thank you thank you very much Ella. so um i've pre-allocated um randomly into three groups one group will be chaired by or facilitated by meron our chief exec one group will be facilitated by brian our chair and then ella you and i will facilitate facilitate the third group and that'll enable me to float to make sure everything everyone's in meeting yeah. so um we have about 15 minutes and with two minutes to go you'll get just a little bit of a warning that the uh meeting uh room will close down then there'll be a minute water warning and then very unceremoniously it just moves everyone back automatically into the uh, main room and um, just one uh, logistical thing um what we will do we will have a few minutes to to feed back some of the one or two of the key findings or key recommendations coming out of the breakout group. So if someone could be identified at the beginning who would be willing to feed back to the rest of the group at the end of the session. So with no further to do, I will move everyone into their breakout groups. I hope. Okay. I did see that actually come up. Oh, recording it. I did just see oh, that. Actually, I'm going to okay. so I'm going to stop recording this because we don't need okay. to have this. Uh, okay. To, that's it. Hello. <laughs> Unmute. Are we feeding back then, um, Neil? Yes, just very, um, yeah, very uh, quickly. Um, okay. Danny has now joined us, so I've just oh, given a bit of a brief that we're just going to be spending just a couple of minutes um, yeah. feeding back. Then just, then just feeding back from our breakout rooms, then, and we look forward to joining you, Danny. Um, so we've had a number of um, interesting organisations. We've had peace with the Wheelchair uh, Skills College looking for opportunities to find out the path, what's the pathway for pilots and new innovations. Um, you know, Maria was asked, um, did you say you were a nurse, Maria, um, working with them to mention the Queen's College, the Queen's Nursing Institute, and just that the the message needs to be clearer perhaps, or just because of all the noise and everything changing so much, there's so much going on, which I think, you know, we can all agree on. Um, 
Kirit um, came in to say that he wanted to get more, you know, more um, support um, and just, you know, really kind of poking and pushing um, the, um, the various organisations he can to get feedback, funding, help. Um, if I've got anything wrong there, guys, please do um, come in. And then we had Barbara, um, who was standing in for Kevin, a partner. Um, they run a chiropractic care organization and um, working with homeless people and, and different um, uh, disadvantaged groups and they also kind of mentioned um, about working in Norfolk and the loneliness that uh, is quite inherent there um, after Covid so um, just people looking to um, make connections um, strengthen their their organizations and what they've got already but trying to um, just make a mark through all the noise that's going on is that seems to be the message that's going on there. But I've invited, um, as did Neil, people to get in touch and speak to us. Um, as I say, everything's always very useful uh, to us here at the Health Creation Alliance. Um, so all the information is helpful. So thank you guys for all your feedback. If anybody wants to add on to that, please do, although time is clearly of the essence. <laughs> thank you. Okay, did Melon or Brian just want to give just a couple of very quick sentences on the, the key outputs from your breakout groups? Sure, thank you. We had a, a lovely discussion and um, new people who I, I haven't met, I think, but um, um, uh, Orbit Housing Association and looking to work with uh, tenants. Uh, the conversation was more about kind of the work between the group members. Um, the ever difficult uh, task of connecting with GPs, and I referenced our work about the need for for money to be able to build relationships. It, it takes resources to build relationships, and the, the concern that that money is going into provider collaboratives and into the integrated care board rather than any of it going to the integrated care partnership. So, look forward to um, you know further conversations, hopefully on on that, um, and then. Uh, Jan doing a, um, a campus in Settle, a health campus, which was and talking about enabling people to flow through the space and drawing different partners in. And what a nice word that was to, to use for that. And then um, just also, I think Jan explaining that, you know, oh, that we're UK wide as well and that um, we always, uh, uh, you know, what can we do to do more? Because um, she always finds our, use, our, our meetings useful and informative, and we would love to do 10 times the amount or more than that, because uh, reach 100 times the people, because, um, you know, th this, this is an important message we have. Thank you, and Brian. Thanks. So, yes, we had a, a, a delicious small group, and um, it worked very well. We had um, the main message in terms of the kind of insight was that um, the 42 ICSs are likely not to be able to compensate for the atomization that currently exists across the NHS. So the atomization includes the different contracts and the different contractors and providers and the um, uh, the split that's required to make this contracting work. And although we can see that the ICSs are meant, are meant to pull things together, um, there's a concern that actually underneath, um, because the system requires so many different contracts, it actually um, won't be able to do that. So uh, there were examples about the way it doesn't work across uh, health records and across disability and there's a, a concern that this system may not actually work adequately in the future. Um, there's an example from Alicante in Spain, which shows that linking can be done. Um, so there may be worth looking there. And of course, there was the point that Dave Trigger made about funding, which uh, we talked about again. We've got support from um, Dean O'Shea, who's very involved with disability groups, um, who's very keen to help. Um, and I, I look forward to, to working with him and his groups. Um, and Dave Trigger turns out that they're all incredibly busy with lots of different groups, but um, Dave's not only is a patient leader, but also is now recently involved with the police, which is a, 
a, a, a group that we have worked with in the past, but would be very good to strengthen our links with. So um, I think that was it was very helpful and, and there's more support from us um, from those two people. So that's a great step forward. Excellent. Well done, everybody. And thank you so much for that input. And I have to give a shout out to Asmina, who I forgot to mention as well. She's very knowledgeable, very helpful. She helped me on the group there. Um, so finally, um, thank you for waiting, Danny. Um, 11.30 to 11.55, we have um, Danny Kruger, MP with us, um, the Department for Leveling Up um, Housing and Community on Leveling Up the White Paper. So over to you, Danny. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ella. Um, you said that you had someone from Wiltshire College here. Did I catch that? Um, not, not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I might, I might have misheard. I um, have anyways, put it in the box and I'll very pleased to, to hear it. If, if so, um, <laughs> um, you do great work. Anyway, um, sorry if my screen keeps sending me, making me go. Oh, it, just, it can't handle the light behind me. Anyway, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, very pleased to join you. Thanks, it's good to get that uh, feedback from your group conversations as well. I'm the uh, mm -hmm. Parliamentary Private Secretary at the Department for Communities, which means I'm the sort of non-ministerial um, aid to the ministers. Uh, it slightly constrains me because I'm not, even though I'm not a minister, I'm supposed to behave like one and not speak, not freelance, uh, but, but, but have collective responsibilities. So I, um, but it, it, as this is a private conversation, I'm very happy to, say a bit about what I think the opportunities are beyond government, where government is at the moment. Uh, I, I, and I do, and, you know, attended a couple of meetings with you guys before, um, and Meryn and I have spoken. I, I think the whole concept of health creation, and I you know, appreciate you changed the name a year or two ago to that, is such an important direction of travel that we need to be on as a country and, uh, and the NHS. And, you know, increasingly it is understood, I think, in government that we need more than a acute remedial uh, health care service and more of a focus on health creation. So I think you're in the vanguard of the, the change that's underway. And the more we can all do to push it, the better, because there are major institutional uh, resistances, as you're all familiar with. In terms of where the government is, and from my perspective, is the, is the levelling up department, which of course is the government's flagship domestic agenda and runs through everything that we're trying to do uh, in, in, in economic and social policy. This is, uh, is, is central to the mission. And in fact, there are 12 missions in the levelling up white paper. Um, I don't expect you to have read because it's that long. Uh, but one of the 12 missions is uh, explicitly around reducing inequalities in, in health. So the, it says by 2030, the gap in healthy life expectancy between local areas where it is highest and lowest will have narrowed. And by 2035, healthy life expectancy overall will rise by five years. So there's a mission to reduce the inequalities in uh, in healthy life expectancy and to improve it overall. So I think that's a good framing mission. Um, and as, it, as, 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 it, as you can tell there, it's not about inputs and throughputs um, and you know, investment and, and activity in the health service. It's about outcomes and health, the healthiness of the population. Um, oh, how, how, how is the government supposed to do this? Well, naturally enough, a lot of the focus is on the acute sector um, and investment in uh, in specialist care and, and, in, and in general uh, hospital secondary care. And I think that's natural and right. There's enormous demand and not, not to mention a massive backlog from COVID. So investment in acute services is naturally, in a sense, the first thing the government's doing, but it is also making a major emphasis on prevention and on public health. Um, which was the direction of travel before the pandemic and and will be again uh, as we rebuild. I'm pleased to see a renewed folk commitment to social prescribing, um, which I have a sort of curious attitude to, because on the one level, I think it's quite inappropriate to be uh, treating, well, GPs 
as gatekeepers to community activity, which should exist anyway. And <laughs> one shouldn't be uh, required to go through one's GP and then for the GP to be funding uh, civil society. This should be happening anyway. Um, and what the doctor should be asking is, you know, are you keeping busy and active? Um, and to which the answer should not be, well, there's not, I don't know what to do or where to go. Um, but seeing as that is the case, uh, and it, it's quite right that we encourage and incentivize doctors to think of alternatives to prescribing. And one, one of my interests in Parliament, I'm the chairman of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Prescribed Drug Dependency. So I'm very conscious of the enormous harm and, and financial expense that goes into unnecessary drug prescriptions. Uh, so I welcome this focus. I wish it were not necessary that health is commissioning civil society in this way, but I recognise it's preferable to uh, to, the, to the status quo ante. So there's a commitment to 900,000 social prescriptions um, uh, or 900,000 people referred to social prescribing uh, by 2023-24. Uh, we've got a uh, commitment to 100,000 new social prescribing link workers in place. Um, so I think that, that, that remains a, a strong focus, uh, as well as what's called green social prescribing link workers. So there's a focus on environmental activity as well, which is great. Um, so there is a, so that's the health bit of the, uh, of the Leveling Up White Paper. And I do, do encourage you to have a look if you want. There's a couple of pages on it in this great big document. The other thing that the, like, the White Paper emphasizes is the importance of social infrastructure and community institutions as the foundation for prosperity and that includes social infrastructure and the institutions of belonging uh, and of local socializing and 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 collective action social action um, i'm particularly pleased that there's an emphasis in there on what, what, what are called community covenants which is the ability of local places to uh, stakeholders in a local place, communities themselves, local public sector, uh, private sector, civil society, to collaborate on developing a mission for their area, uh, which could, and I hope would, include a focus on health creation. And uh, and indeed, there is a, a explicit mention in the white paper around uh, health facilities being essential to what communities can and should be able to uh, design and organize for themselves so this the whole emphasis on community empowerment goes well beyond you know formal devolution you know more power for town halls and uh local government which i think is important too it goes beyond that to how can communities themselves be empowered to work collaboratively with local stakeholders to create the kind of place they want to live in uh, and health will be at the center of that and then lastly um the and and you were just discussing it but the health uh, and Care Act, which has just gone through creating these new ICSs. Uh, I mean, I, I share the point that Brian was making at the end there, which is that the objective needs to be to overcome the atomization, the atomization in society generally, which our health systems uh, reflect and exacerbate. So the principle of integration, which is at the heart of the Act, is of course a welcome one. That is, we all recognise as the essential problem of a disintegrated service that doesn't talk to itself um, and certainly doesn't talk to communities. So the aspiration of integration is the right one. I think it's good to have local commissioning systems, as described, that are committed to that. And uh, but the, the 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 opportunity will only be realised if local leaders and partners play their roles well, because the danger is of always with efforts integration is that they become new means by which the bureaucracy uh, forms and excludes the more organic uh, and um, uh, the, 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 the bits of the system that don't fit neatly into a new integrated bureaucracy. Uh, so the integration that is essential in my mind is patients themselves, families, communities, uh, the, civil, the institutions of civil society that aren't part of the statutory system uh, and don't fit neatly into you know, 
procurement arrangements. So that, that I think the opportunity is there to get this right with these new structures, but just setting the structures up will not make it happen. It depends on all of us locally to deliver it um, and to create a more human health service uh, or a more human uh, sort of health ecology. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously supportive of what the government is doing, but I don't think it's sufficient. Uh, and we need the culture to be right. And that's the work that you guys are doing. I think the conversations that I just heard at the end of there, it's the new, the emerging uh, culture in the in the wider health systems to uh, to get it, to get this right. Um, so that's where we are. Happy to uh, explore more uh, and to take ideas that you have uh, back to ministers. Thanks, Ella. Lynn, Lynn, would you like to, um, I can't seem to pick up um, Ella at the moment, so Lynn, I'll just step in and share for yeah. you. I'd like to put your question. Hello. Hiya. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Danny. Um, great pleasure to have you here today. Um, the challenges of government are not um, underestimated. I entirely sympathise with the challenges you're currently um, facing. But uh, one of the issues that remains a concern to me is this um, disconnect between the social model of health and the medical model of health and this, this focus on the NHS as the only instrument to deliver um, health improvements, uh, because there are many other partners involved in that. And, it, you know, we've got a means tested service versus a, a free at the point of care. We've got a medical model of health rather than a social model of health. We've got a pathogenic model of health rather than salutogenic, which is, of course, the health creation model. And um, the Health and Care Act does not seem to um, address that at all. I'm really heartened to hear you mention yet again this, the role of civil society, and I'm mindful of your publications mm. on this. Um, I'm mindful that your department is working to create funding to support social capital and that a large sum of money was mentioned in the Queen's speech. Just wondered whether you could give an indication for any next steps that we might support or feedback that would be helpful for you to bring about that uh, change in uh, perception that integration is the only way forward, as in integration with the NHS, whereas in fact the NHS is, is a sickness model, not a health model. Thank you. Thank you. Very well put, Lynn. Thank you. I mean, I, I um, applaud that, that. And, you know, I wish it were as straightforward as us uh, being able to... Well, I, I wish it was as straightforward as if ministers would say what you've just said, and then the change would happen. Uh, to, to a degree, they do. I mean, you know, as, you, as, as we're all very familiar with, it's difficult to criticise the NHS. Um, at all, uh, but to suggest, as you've just done, that it's essentially a sickness model rather than a health creation model, I think is pro pro probably not going to be ex expressed quite so bluntly, but is understood and and is put slightly more, you know, politically, uh, diplomatically, I should say, um, by ministers all the time, and 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 of course by N the NHS itself, by managers and clinicians all the way through. Um, the the challenge is. Uh, affecting a, a, a deep, the deep cultural change in the system. You know, I'm sorry if the, the Health Act doesn't reflect that sufficiently. Uh, as I say, the aspiration is that we achieve integration through local uh, stakeholders being involved in commissioning and designing services. I think the opportunity is now there for that to happen, but it will happen by us all championing it. Uh, in terms of what the... And you're right that social capital is, is essential to the uh, to the to the leveling up mission, and health creation is part of that, and explicitly recognised as such. I just think we need to continue to to make these arguments, and I, you know, to, to to connect with as many political people as possible, so that this language is not so unfamiliar. Um, I haven't heard the word salutogenic, but salutogenic before. Is that the word? It's very excellent. Uh, the chat. <laughs> yeah, please put that in so we get this spelling and pronunciation right but I know what you mean uh and I think that's absolutely right um so uh I mean quickly I'll let because others will want to 
speak, but I, I think we have a real issue with the way Whitehall is constructed around the services that, that exist. There's a sort of natural prejudice for incumbency uh, and all the ministers that, because I'm always trying to lobby ministers on some particular thing like prescribed drug dependency. And it's not really clear who the minister for that should be because different parts of the system are represented in different ways rather than, so there isn't a, there isn't a kind of health promotion responsibility in government. They, they all, they're all looking after the existing systems. Uh, so, uh, but that's our challenge. Anyway, thanks for making that point so clearly and well. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I know that, and thank you, Danny. Um, I know that uh, Brian's been waiting a while and then we'll go on to tele. Thank you, Brian. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this meeting, Dan. It's much appreciated. Um, two things. Uh, you mentioned, I think, that the Act enhances or will focus on um, acute trusts quite a lot, and I don't quite understand why you'd want to do that, really. I think it should be quite the opposite. Uh, the NHS has only a tangential impact, really, on population health so I'm not sure and trusts would have even a smaller impact on that so I might have misunderstood what you said but if that's what you said I think that needs to be challenged but more more importantly I think is um, how do you think the leveling up um, department can support health creation what what can we do together that would move that along with the powers that you have and the, the you know the centrality of this idea in the current current uh, government Mm. I, I mean, the point I was making is simply that the focus of, of the government as a whole in health has been, you know, since the election when all these new hospitals were promised, ar around addressing the addressing the problem of waiting lists for acute care uh, or for or for elective surgery. So that's where the emphasis is politically. It's what gets the noise in the media. This the preventative and the public health agendas. Are all, as we all know, have always been the poor relations. So that's what needs to change. Uh, and I think the tanker is slowly turning. Uh, but we still have the NHS we more or less created in 1948. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's a slow process. But, but I think these arguments are now landing. And, the, you know, the, the emphasis on, on preventable health conditions, crucially obesity, uh, that the pandemic highlighted, I think, it, are concentrating minds. And if we're thinking about preventing the next crisis, uh, this has got to be central. And, and actually, to be fair to Sajid Javid, he makes prevention one of his absolute priorities, uh, the others being COVID recovery and work, workforce. So um, so that, that, is, that, that is recognized. In terms of what the levelling up department can do, well, I mean, the whole focus is on addressing the spatial inequality that the UK experiences, the most spatially unequal country in the developed world, um, with, a, with, with that being most evident in life expectancy from different parts of the country. So just in a simple, the, the overall objective is to reduce these inequalities that will by definition address health inequalities and improve uh, overall health as evidenced by that mission that the white paper sets out the, the the way it will do this in my view and the believers that we have are around devolution of power allowing which ultimately means that local partners will have a proper incentive to pool budgets and act preventatively to uh to reduce demand on expensive acute services whether that's in health or in other bits of the public sector benefits criminal justice all the rest of it you know, the model we all really need is one whereby we recognize the upfront investment in uh, in families, young people, uh, and in the environment and in uh, public health, reduce the demand for expensive remedial services later on. So even if you're only thinking fiscally, and ultimately systems do think fiscally, uh, even if the human beings in them are slightly less um, uh, computer minded, um, systems think fiscally, and the the we will only get a preventative social model and a preventative public sector if we localize power, in my view. So, and that is what leveling up agenda enables. Uh, 
at a, at a regional or sub-regional level with these new combined authorities that enable uh, local authorities to, to collaborate, some of them under mayors, which will have even more power, um, but also at the, at the hyper-local level with those community covenants that I mentioned, which I think are very exciting, because partly because they're exciting, partly because they're still very undefined. Should be possible for a place to, I hope the way it'll work is that places come up with plans. This is how we want to operate. And this is, these are the sort of systems and services that we want in our, in our place. Uh, that will get uh, rubber stamped by, by government and funded, we hope. Uh, and then we can see that actually happen. So it's by community empowerment is the way that we will achieve better health outcomes. Okay. Thank you, Danny. I'm sorry to have to jump in there. I've got one more question from Meron as we're Great. running out of time. Sorry, everybody, if you didn't get a chance there. Thank you, Danny, though. Fantastic answers. Great. Meron. Thank you, um, Danny, very much, yes, for, for being here. Um, I, I noticed earlier that you said you're, um, you know, you had, I can't remember the word you use now, but in terms of social, um, social prescribing, you seem to be advocating for building civil society up but separately from the NHS which continues with the clinical or medical uh, model um, whereas we are arguing um, to do that together uh, so we are asking the NHS to engage in this but the, the big problem here is that the relationships are not custed into the model so that that effort that is involved in building relationships between the NHS and outside the NHS are not custed into the model and this was a big finding of a recent report we did and so um so you know um outside the nhs constantly doesn't manage to connect through to the nhs mm. there are big gains to the nhs changing and is redesigning itself a little bit to you know to, to engage with with all of this but the the way that the route to doing that is is sort of stymied through this lack of relationship and i suppose my my question um from that that and supporting people, there might be 100,000 new caseworkers, but it's at the strategic level that local authorities are looking for that. So strategic clinical level, and that's what's missing with uh, the relationship with the NHS. Um, and, and so there's a gap there. I'm happy to talk to you more about that, mm -hmm. but a, a, little bit, a little bit with tongue in cheek here. Um, I guess my question to you is, you know, should the Health Creation Alliance be trying to badge ourselves under social prescribing to be able to sort of be in the thrall of, of this or like many others have done because that's where the money's going or should we be appealing to local authorities instead rather than the NHS in your world but what we're really trying to do is something which isn't either of those things and we're trying to actually say look it's health creation that changes people's lives and that improves health it's not social prescribing that's a patient caseworker role but health creation is a much much bigger thing we need yeah. to create be creating the ecosystem and the infrastructure for that across all parts of the of the um, of public sector yes so I, I completely agree and I, I think I would for what it's worth advise you resist the uh, siren call of, of social prescribing as a sort of budget to, to tuck in under because I think you're totally right this goes way beyond that and the point I was making is that it's not that I don't think health should be intimately involved in uh, civil society and in signposting people to health creating activities rather than just medicalizing their conditions. I completely think that. My concern is the idea that we that, that it's only via health commissioning through social prescribing that we can build up a, a strong civil society that gives doctors somewhere to send people. Uh, and that, and that only if but if doctors have a budget, or rather the social prescribing link workers have a budget to commission, you know, gardening clubs or choirs or whatever it is, that those things will exist. I wish they existed independently of health of the health service. Uh, they should just be existing in our communities, and it shouldn't be just you only reach them through a through a GP clinic. Uh, that was the point I was making. But yes, no, I completely want to see uh, civil society and health uh developing together um and the health giving uh qualities of these sorts of activities are their primary well one of their primary uh values i mean others being socialization and social cohesion and life skills and all that um so so i think we're in agreement I, yeah i mean i i would i think you should be as ambitious as possible about the whole 
salutogenesis mission. Uh, and um, uh, I haven't quite got the adjective for it, salutogenic. Uh, anyway, so, so yes, and I would be very, I mean, interesting your point about strategic level relationships not being there. And if there's anything I can do, maybe we can fix up a separate call and I can think about how to try and get the relevant bit of Whitehall to engage. Um, I'd be happy to try and do that. Thank you. That'd be fantastic. Um, thank you, Danny. Thank you, Meryn. Um, Telly had a question. I'm not sure if you've got time for that, um, Neil. Unfortunately, we're out of time now. We've okay. just got so we've just really got the the summary. So I'll just hand over to Neil. Thank you, everybody, for today. Uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, lots to think about there, and lots of action to to take place. So, thanks to all our speakers, Chris and Danny, and over to you, Neil. I must jump off. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again, Danny. So, um, so it's for me just to give um, just a final summary. Um, so. These meetings, they always fly. The, you know, the two hours goes just so quickly, which actually goes to show how engaging and, the, um, and interesting the content is. So thank you once again, everyone, for their input. And I just wanted to just take a, a look at the just a number of things, and sort of in a summary, is a number of things that we are um, doing over the next um, a few months, just to raise awareness of them. Everyone, all of our members will hear about these, of course, through our um, newsletter. But um, the first thing, in terms of our partnership with the King's Fund, we are presenting um, an hour session at their conference on Communities the Best Medicine. That's on the 8th of June. There's still tickets available for that. And um, there we'll be exploring the different types of relationships between key stakeholders and how those can be further enhanced and developed. We mentioned, we've mentioned we've got a number of um, publications coming up. We have two from the Health Foundation um, coming up and they will be launched before the summer, as well as uh, another publication for NHS Property Services that will also be launched for the summer. So look out for those. Um, as we go into the summer, we will also be sending out a lot more information around our coming of age events that Merrin touched upon, culminating in the House of Lords um, celebration of all things um, health creation. So we will be reaching out to people in terms of uh, thought leadership opportunities to contribute to that, but also in terms of potential sponsorship. So um, please, um, as always, get in touch with us. And I know that very many of the people who are still sort of survived to the end of the call are very active members. So it'll be great just to keep in contact and we will follow up with everything that we've um, that we've talked about in the breakout groups today. Finally, we are going to be um, sending out a survey, just a short email survey very, um, very shortly. So it'd be great if people can respond to that. And as always, um, we don't forget that we have our discovery learning programs. So um, I'm sure that most people are already well aware of the different types of discovery learning programs, but we go from something from an hour and a half long, which is an introduction to health creation, um, to something which actually could be much longer over a period of nine months. So again, if anyone's interested in um, learning more and doing some action learning, then uh, please contact us. So with no further ado, I will hand over to Ella, who will close up the meeting. Well, uh, that was really, really uh, quite a lot of fascinating information and it's a lot to, to go over there to reflect on. So as I just mentioned in the box, chat box, do uh, request your video copy so you can, you know, refresh your memory about today's meeting. You can get in touch with us with any thoughts or, you know, questions that you kind of have in a second wind. Um, but, very, uh, you know, so much valuable stuff there and so much going on out there. It's really, a really interesting time. Um, let's hope that all of the positive things we've been working on here at the Health Creation Alliance will be put into motion and your help will be uh, great, greatly received, very really gratefully received. So, Brian, um, best wishes to you and uh, thank you so much for everything that you've, you've done and that you are, um, and, and good luck with your your time off, <laughs> whatever you do. Um, thank you, Danny. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Meryn. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody, for today. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Do keep in touch. And a big thank you to Ella. And it's great oh, to see yeah. a real world with the family in the background. And Yeah, uh, I've got two poorly boys off school. It's just absolutely, you know, um, just typical. <laughs> but they're fine, Ella. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much for doing such a great job, Ella. Thank, thank, thank you very, very much. much. God Thanks bless everybody. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Mom.